To get into then the topic uh, for today, uh, this webinar takes inspiration from a project in which ANCA was involved, um, which looked at the effective involvement of stakeholders in external quality assurance activities. We're going to hear just a, in just a moment from my colleague, Mia Holman, um, a bit more about the project and its outcomes. And then we have uh, a great lineup of speakers joining us uh, from across Europe to share some, um, some practical examples about how they engage with stakeholders. Uh, of course, their, their interventions will not be exhaustive. They, each of the agencies represented, represented engage with stakeholders in a wide variety of ways, but we've asked them to pick up on one or two very specific um, approaches uh, to share with you today. So we have Karina Maguire from uh, QQI in Ireland. We have um, Aslu Louise Slitter and Helen Broughton from Nokut in Norway. Uh, we have Adohi Galkisan from Armenia, um, Anchor, the agency there. And we have Alistair Delaney from QAA in the UK. Uh, the webinar is not specifically um, about the COVID, current COVID situation, but of course um, the circumstances have forced many of us to, to rethink how we engage with our, our stakeholders. So we've no doubt that this topic will also come up and we will address it also in, in the discussion at the end. But as you can see from, from the number of speakers, we've got a lot to get through today. Um, so I'm going to hand over uh, straight away now to um, my colleague, Milia Holman um, from ENCA. And um, she will uh, introduce a little bit the background to the project and highlight some of the, the main findings uh, that came out of the work. Milia, over to you. Thanks, Anna, and hello to everyone. So I will start by saying a couple of words about the Escort project in general, just to give a bit of an overview and background. So this is a two year project that was launched in 2019. So it's now coming to its end uh, uh, soon. And during this time, uh, the consortium has been examining and exploring stakeholder involvement in external quality assurance activities and looked into the ways of how to make this engagement more effective and diversified. And here you can see the partners that have been involved. So we've had five quality assurance uh, agencies um, that have uh, identified stakeholder involvement as, uh, as an area that they wish to um, um, improve in their processes and activities. Uh, four of them are ENCO members and one affiliate. Then we've had three stakeholder organizations. So in addition to ENQA, we've had ESO representing students' perspective and Eurasia representing higher education institutions. And then the, the project has been coordinated by the uh, Romanian Ministry of Education. Uh, we've also had support from two international experts that had a key role in, in developing the guide. So then I will talk a bit about the main outputs of the, the project. First, about the study on stakeholder involvement in external quality assurance. So uh, under coordination of ENQA, uh, drawing on various sources of um, information, the, the study maps on stakeholder engagement in external quality assurance in the European higher education area and presents examples of good practices. So we've, uh, we've had um, a survey to ENCO members and affiliates, and we've looked into the external review reports of ENCO agency reviews um, and analyzed some of the recommendations and recommendations through there. So some of the themes that we covered um, in the study um, <laughs> include benefits, barriers, communication, recruitment, training, and independence. And yeah, as Anna said, we've had um, four case studies also included in the study. Uh, and then we've we are happy that they feature also in this webinar today. Then I've included here a slide that gives a bit of an overview of the different um, stakeholder groups that agencies um, involve in their activities and processes in general. So we can see that students, uh, higher education institutions, staff, 
and employers are among the, the most involved groups. Um, so it's not really a surprise, but kind of uh, reconfirms of the knowledge that we have already. Then on the other hand, we can see that there are some other groups that are less involved, uh, such as civil society. Uh, and when we look at the involvement in, more in detail in different activities, we can kind of see the, the same trend in the, in the different activities. Although, of course, there are some variations in the, in the level of engagement. Then uh, when we look at the um, involvement, the stakeholder involvement, it's also important to ask why are we uh, engaging the, the stakeholders? So one of the questions that we asked in the, in the survey to uh, ENGWA members and affiliates was about what are your objectives that you try to uh, reach through stakeholder engagement. And the, the main objectives came out are the making the QA system more comprehensive and responsive to societal needs, and then increasing trust and mutual understanding. Some other benefits that the, the agencies identified in open questions uh, include of helping and building the higher education sector and creating a feeling of collective ownership, as well as making the external evaluation results more credible, and then also increasing students' awareness. Um, we also looked at some of the barriers that the agencies identify uh, for stakeholders' effective involvement. So here we can actually see that they are the same groups uh, that are mostly involved, that come across as having the main barriers for effective involvement, according to the agencies. So this is, uh, on the other hand, quite logical, but then it can serve also as a good reminder that uh, involvement is not necessarily always effective. And even if agencies have those stakeholders in their processes, they may still need to look at the ways of how to make it more effective and um, real. So for students, um, some of the main barriers have, have been identified by 70% of the agencies is lack of sufficient knowledge or experience in QA and employers. The, the reasons were a bit more varied, but um, they include lack of interest or motivation or lack of time and or financial motivation. So for teaching staff, there were also uh, uh, lack of time or and or financial motivation, but we can see that students and employers got a bit more of the higher score when it comes to the barriers. So this notion of um, involvement versus effective uh, involvement brings me to the, the guide then, that is then the, the main output of the ESCO project. So this um, guide for effective stakeholders involvement in quality assurance uh, aims to strengthen dialogue and cooperation with stakeholders as well as to deepen the engagement and to make it more effective. So the target audience is primarily QA agencies and national authorities, um, but it can be interesting reading for the stakeholders themselves. And here just a quick overview of the different themes that the, the um, guide covers. So uh, I really welcome you to read the, the guide as well as the study to, to, for more information if you're interested. Then just a quick um, request in case you have already read the, the study and guide or pla are planning to read them, we would appreciate your feedback. It's a very short survey that you can find on the, the project website, just to, for us to, as the consortium, to uh, measure the impact that the project has had. Thanks a lot.
Thank you very much, Amelia. I, I know that there's a huge amount of content in, in both the study and the guide, so it's very difficult to uh, to pick out just a, a few points to, to present in, in the few minutes that you were, were allocated for, for today's introduction. So thank you for that, and I, I um, encourage people to go and have a look. Um, at the um, the guide and the study, um, the links are are in the chat. We do have a, a, a question from from the audience um, as to whether you have a concrete example of the involvement of civil society. I don't know whether there was anything um, specific mentioned in the in the study in relation to that. Um, if if you have something, or or maybe um, one of our speakers, uh, uh, other speakers, has has an example in that regard. Emilia, was it was it specifically picked up on in the in the study? Well, as I said, this comes uh, out of the results that many of the agencies do not involve the civil society, and then we could also see in some of the recommendations in the in the Engwa agency review reports that um, some of the agencies received recommendation in this regard. But yeah, unfortunately, I don't have really um, many examples of. How, how agencies have uh, involved civil society. I'm sure there are, but uh, I just don't have. So in case uh, the panelists uh, have, we, we are happy to hear. Uh, do any of our panels uh, engage civil society in, in, their, um, in their work specifically? Maybe just to say, um, Anna, that obviously our consultations are quite public and because we do cover quite a diverse range of stakeholders, certainly uh, we would get a broad um, range of responses. Um, the social partners are certainly very important to us as well because they're supporting the infrastructure and the institutions, obviously. So. Thank you, Corinna. Maybe um, some of our, our other um, listeners, um, some of our participants today also have examples. So um, please feel free to uh, to mention these uh, in, in the chat in, in response to Linda's question. Um, but I think, um, Corinna, you, you've um, jumped in already. So I, I think this uh, is a good moment then to, to let you proceed with, with your presentation. Um, uh, please do um, uh, participants ask, ask your questions in the chat. We have a couple of minutes after each presentation to pick up on any any concrete questions um, for the presenter and then more general questions of course I will take forward to the to the discussion at the end. Karina over to you. That's great thank you Anna and thank you very much Amelia. Um, Enqua have asked us this morning to to focus on the example that was provided in that uh, study that Amelia referred to um, and that was the QQI consultation uh, framework. So essentially uh, what we're doing today is we're looking at how important that framework was to bring us into the future, which was really uh, strategically very important for us. It was a great opportunity actually to reflect on this uh, time when we introduced this particular framework. So QQI, as, as most of you are aware, is uh, an agency, a, a public agency that covers qualifications and quality assurance across the post-secondary landscape. We also uh, cover international uh, providers in addition to further and higher education and training providers, the National Framework and NARIC. Academic integrity is a really important piece that has been added to our uh, legislative brief more recently. So just to um, explain, you're not, you're not really meant to look at this particular uh, diagram in detail. I suppose this is what we inherited back in 2012 as an amalgamated organization. And one of the biggest tasks we had was to try and unify and rationalize a lot of the policies that we had at the time. So again, this is just to provide an understanding of the diversity of those particular uh, stakeholders that were inherited by QQI. And um, I suppose the predecessor agency policies needed to be rationalized and uh, condensed into QQI policy. So although um, a formal consultation framework would seem like common sense to a lot of people. It was very much um, a Bible for QQI in terms of how we were to progress in making sure that we connected with all our key stakeholders 
and uh, did that in a very structured way and also uh, consistent. What we decided to do at the time was uh, to basically establish a consultation framework. There was plenty of advice out at the time from OECG, or sorry, OECD. Um, and also from the European Commission, there is plenty of frameworks around to look at with regard to best practice on um, engaging with stakeholders. And again, although it seems like common sense, uh, when you actually look at the details and the important pieces in, in this particular policy approach that we took to, to consultation, it's, it's really, I suppose, important to understand that uh, this had a profound impact on our system and it made sure that we covered as many of the options and issues that we had to at the time, which was actually quite a, a difficulty for us. So really what do we mean by consultation? For us, consultation is ensuring that those who are going to be impacted by your policy um, are at the center of the discussions around that and that you're in a position to take up their views and uh, you know that they have some sort of opportunity to contribute to the decision making process. So just to look at this consultation um, framework again, looking at the subject, the purpose and the objectives, it provided a, a rigor and a robust process for engagement where everybody internally had to look at the question that was being raised and the issue that we were trying to resolve, the purpose and objectives. So taking this particular structure, it really meant that uh, everybody had an opportunity to, to plan for this particular policy approach that we were, uh, we were taking up. Identifying your stakeholders is essential, really essential. You know, I've given you a map already, but there's always stakeholders that you've forgotten. And a stakeholder list becomes a really important internal uh, part of your, your resources. Just because you have a piece of legislation that tells you you must actually engage with stakeholders on a compulsory basis does not mean uh, that you're consulting with those few stakeholders. It's really important to map out the, the landscape and understand the stakeholders in particular that are going to impact on your work. And of course, the institutions were quite central to that, understanding what was going to impact on their work as well. The methods and timing, um, timing, exceptionally important. Again, it seems like a common sense piece. You get your timing wrong on a particular piece of policy engagement for your institutions. They need time to take it up, take it to their governance uh, for the other policy makers that are involved in the consultation. You could throw your policy that you need to implement maybe at a particular point in time out the window if your particular timing is wrong and you have not allowed enough time for people to engage and as I say run it through their own governance processes. It's always important of course for resources and costing to understand the sensitivities around a particular policy. Um, will it be more complicated? Will it require more engagement? Will it require more staff, uh, more workshops, uh, more, I suppose, face-to-face uh, -face engagement if it is particularly complicated or sensitive? So publication then is, is again kind of central to the um, transparency around this process. The consultation document itself is one piece and mapping out the deadlines and the responses and the period of time that you are opening up. This, this particular process is quite an active and, and dynamic one and it, it is actually quite a prolonged process of, of consultation. But that again is to provide an opportunity with the um, with the stakeholders to come back in and to air their issues and to ensure that all of the aspects, options, scenarios that you have placed in your consultation have been captured, which is not always the case. And I'll explain that in a minute. Analysis and feedback, again, a really exceptional uh, the important part of the process. Cannot understate the importance of taking your feedback, making sure your stakeholders have an opportunity to publish their views, making sure that you've taken an analysis of that, and also to explain the rationale for not necessarily following on from their particular point of view. Everybody has a particular context that they need to, to uh, stay well within. Reviewing the process, as we are agencies, we need to review and improve, always see what we've missed out on. So just very quickly to look at the life cycle piece here. Um, 
publishing a green paper, I suppose, well, actually, let's start internally. Your internal audience, absolutely critical. Keeping the coherence across the organization, making sure there's no duplication overlap. The green paper then um, is also important because it's much more open than draft policy. It, it presents the question openly. It looks at many options, even options that the agency may not be too happy about having to implement. So all options that are in any way feasible are presented and scenarios are, are then provided to the stakeholder uh, landscape so that uh, there is a little bit of variety there. And as I say, it's, it's dynamic. The key stakeholders are actually well identified at this stage. However, what about access to those stakeholders that wouldn't necessarily be open and obvious, uh, an important part of that. Direct engagement is also important where matters are particularly sensitive or where perceptions have been misunderstood. And this is all about understanding the perception of your, of your stakeholder. Again, uh, responses to things like a green paper really give you a genuine insight into where your stakeholders are coming from, their expectations, their strategic plans and just their misinterpretations of how you're going to operate and approach uh, your particular task as a, a legislative body. Um, also, the consultative form is an established kind of stakeholder platform that we have, which has quite a diverse group of stakeholders, very good for, for um, sounding out particularly difficult issues and areas, and also um, very informative in terms of maybe early warning system for aspects that uh, you may not have picked up even in your green paper. The, Pre-consultation is, is also um, an opportunity under this particular framework, although the framework that we've introduced is robust, consistent. It's also important to understand there's plenty of flexibility in it. Sometimes um, a little bit of pre-consultation before you publish your green paper even is, is uh, a good way to go where aspects of what you're trying to resolve are particularly complicated. The feedback, again, really important. It's so important that you get buy-in from your stakeholders, that they understand why you did not take up their particular um, opinion or their feedback or that you're not running with their angle. So it really provides you with an opportunity to, to explain the rationale for the approach that you've taken. The feedback obviously allows you to develop the position and then you have a much more firm uh, white paper. And again, that goes through another little mini consultation process just to see that there's, to ensure there's nothing uh, that you have overlooked in that particular uh, issue that you're trying to resolve. All of this, all of the resources are published on the website. They're published as you go along, any workshops that are held, any presentations, Anything associated with supporting this particular process is published. And as I say, stakeholders that like to respond are also published um, with regard to permissions. They can uh, refer to other submissions from other stakeholders. So that's, I mean, that's really, um, again, it, it looks like common sense, but it's, you know, it's an exceptionally important uh, process and rigor for us as an agency. It's really helped us to unify our policies and to develop policies uh, that are really fit for purpose, evidence-based, and also policies that, um, you know, will last more than the two years because our operating environment is actually quite dynamic. So as I say, there's greater buy-in on the final position from your uh, stakeholders. And then Understanding the rationale of why you did not take up their particular perspective is important because uh, as we've heard from our own stakeholders, particularly during COVID, our independence as an organization and the fact that we are actually working across the further and higher education system is an important uh, it's an important piece of understanding for all stakeholders, particularly the higher education uh, stakeholders. So this strengthened engagement has definitely led to much more strategic collaboration with regard to where we have brought our, um, our consultation pieces today. This particular um, framework has 
taught us so many lessons, some hard lessons. Uh, we have lost out on some slots to implement policy because the timings have been out. But it has really helped us to grapple with particular policies that um, we've tried to implement in a uniform way that apply across the entire system. And I've provided you with an example in the last slide here. Um, yeah, so as I was saying, what we're trying to do is we are trying to uh, establish a strategy around stakeholder engagement. And we have done that in the last couple of years. It's been very, very successful. Uh, as Amelia in the paper referred to this poster that was presented to an ENQA seminar, um, a general assembly uh, a couple of years ago. This is a very strategic approach to dealing with um, stakeholders on a more focused basis. It allows us to understand our priorities. It particularly allows us to understand the impact that all stakeholders, particularly agencies and government bodies and other stakeholders that are, are operating policy in our particular context uh, are having on our own work, the impact they are having and also um, avoiding uh, overlap and duplication with those organizations. Also understanding the burden on your stakeholders, I think is important because you're not the only one chasing, for example, providers uh, to ensure that uh, they can contribute to what is going on or that they can take on a, a new policy piece that you're trying to implement or that they can just actually engage in a quality assurance process. So you need to understand the operating context um, for all of your stakeholders so that the, that particular timing piece is correct. This has been exceptionally successful for us and, and really what we're doing today is as a result of all that early business with regard to um, the, the structured, uh, consistent and rigorous process that we initiated when we were established as an agency. Uh, one of the more successful minute, engagements on this particular front has been with our students. Um, the NSTEP program has been uh, really helpful for us. We've also managed to ensure that collaborating strategically with stakeholders on research is uh, something that allows our uh, standards and guidelines to be disseminated there. Uh, we've called on our stakeholders because we have managed to arrive at a position of trust. And uh, I think the open and transparent way in which we have uh, consulted with stakeholders has really added to that. So that's uh, that's the end step program there. There's information at the back uh, at the end of this. This is just a, a report that we did during uh, COVID where the benefits of that stakeholder engagement really kicked in for us where 56 stakeholder contributions were captured over a matter of three months and we were able to do an independent evaluation across the system. Very, very successful. We can talk about that again. Thank you. That was whirlwind, but thank you, Karina. I uh, I fully realise that having such a, a comprehensive framework, it's very difficult to describe it in in just a few minutes. But I think we got a really good sense of of what it is that that Q, QI are, are doing in that regard. Um, if there are any questions from the audience, please do um, pop them into the chat. I see there's a lot of uh, discussion going on um, about how um, how uh, agencies uh, involve um, stakeholders, particularly in their um, their review panels. Um, I would have, in the meantime, one co very concrete question for you, Karina. The, the the feedback that you give to stakeholders on how you have or have not taken up their suggestions is that um, is that also all public, or do you also have perhaps some private conversations with with certain stakeholder groups to explain your positioning and, and your rationale? No, the feedback is all public. Um, I suppose depending on the, the complexities around the particular policy or guidelines that you're trying to implement. Um, you can also have the one-to-one -one direct engagements where some stakeholders are really not understanding the, the political context, the legislative context or, or the brief, but everything is published. And I think that's one of the most essential uh, parts of the process so that people can understand. So the feedback itself is synthesized and uh, there's rationale applied to the approach that was taken, but the individual contributions themselves are also published so that other stakeholders can understand that you can actually be dealing with quite polar 
opinions when it comes to a complicated policy. And it's actually very advantageous for your stakeholders to see that, Anna. It's a good question. Indeed, and um, you know, coming to this point about uh, potentially having quite polar or different um, opinions, uh, do you have challenges in terms of perhaps the weighting of the opinions of, of prioritizing the different stakeholder groups as to to who to which opinions to give more weight to? Well, I suppose probably the most complicated piece was the core QA guidelines, which uh, was based on the European Standards and Guidelines, and those core guidelines applied across the system. And when you're looking at quality assurance, um, the diversity of, of really the individual context really is a, a perception from an institutional perspective. So I suppose we have had you know, some very critical responses and how we've dealt with those is we've been able to actually explain that the operating context um, that some people are looking for actually is something that they can take responsibility for, whereas we're trying to legislate for the system at a higher level. So you will always find stakeholders coming up with issues that are not applicable to the particular policy or area that you're working on. And that's an important piece to remember that it's not necessarily the policy that's causing them an issue. It's something else uh, that, that most of the time they have uh, under their own control. So finance and funding obviously is is the obvious one there but how they deploy their own resources there's you know everything comes out in consultation but it's still a very healthy open dynamic and active engagement even if it does not apply specifically to your particular policy and as you say you can you still have the flexibility to go back and explain that to them one-to-one -one if they really are um, out of the picture as such. Mm -hmm. I will just then finally pick up on a question that's just popped in, up in the chat, which is, um, does QQI's review process include the involvement of external service providers? And if yes, how do you ensure a clear understanding of their roles and responsibilities about their direct engagement in the review process? External service providers, what, uh, like, what exactly would that entail would be my question. Okay, that, then that's um, actually I would quite ask, a broad. Yes, I would ask um, Denise, who's posted the question, perhaps to um, to elaborate a little bit in the chat, and um, and Karina, perhaps you have an opportunity to to respond in writing. Um, I have seen another question from Ulf, but I will um, keep that um, for the discussion phase at the end. So don't worry, I have seen it. And um, at this stage, then I would hand over to Asluk and uh, Helen from uh, Nukut in Norway. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, Asle, Slette and I, uh, Helen Brotten, we are both senior advisors in NUKET. Asle works with supervision audits and accreditations as well as seminars and I work with analysis, enhancement initiatives and evaluations. We will talk about how NUKET works with stakeholders and how we communicate with them. But first, two short comments about our agency. NUKIT is an expert body under the Ministry of Education and Research. Uh, we were established in 2003, so we have quite a mature system of external quality assurance, now in the middle of the third cycle. Um, and in NUKIT, we have a high level of trust, or in Norway in particular, we see trust um, as important in the higher education system. Uh, between us and the institutions and trust influences the way we work in our methods and how we also communicate with and involve stakeholders. We have a dual mandate. We do both quality assurance and enhancement at, and that is stated in the law. And we also see data and knowledge as key parts of our work. So we gather, synthesize, analyze and disseminate results and knowledge about quality. And we aim to be an ambassador for quality in education to many of our stakeholders. Uh, and some of them are the experts we engage 900 annually, approximately. And in today's presentation about communication with stakeholders, uh, we set out to explore four interrelated uh, questions, which are who, what, why, and how. And by aiming to answer these questions, we will say something about how NUKUT looks at who their stakeholders are, in what activities we reach out to them, the reasoning 
behind our communication, and finally, the ways in which we involve them. So we start then by asking who and why. And a stakeholder could be defined as a person with an interest or concern in something. And it could be added that this person is involved in such a way that it has responsibilities towards the object and an interest in its success. And Milja showed us all the stakeholder categories in the study and allowing ourselves to mix this a bit, uh, we would say that the higher education institutions, including students, teaching staff, administrative staff, alumni, local student unions, and of course, many of the experts in our review panels are one of the most important stakeholders to Nukut. The experts play a significant role beyond fulfilling the standards in the ESG by providing legitimacy to our processes and by bringing important knowledge back to their own institutions. Other stakeholders are the Ministry of Education and Research, different directorates, as well as the National Student Union and civil society. And what characterizes the institutions is that they have different ways of being stakeholders. If we think of the definition considering responsibility, as well as the interest in success, the institutions are dependent on NUKUT when it comes to accreditations and reviews, and it is in their interest that NUKUT does a good job. But to say a bit more about the why questions, why should we engage stakeholders? Uh, the short answer might be because of regulations or the ESG, but another answer is we want to stimulate enhancement and quality cultures. Our recent white paper on higher education in Norway is actually called A Culture for Quality. And if we look at some of the definitions of quality cultures from research, it is exactly about engaging stakeholders. For instance, colleagues in Netherlands, Bendemasje, defined quality culture as an organizational culture in which all stakeholders internal and external cooperates and contributes to the improvement of quality through critical reflection. So they state that it is a move from control to enhancement, which correlates with ownership and autonomy. And is publishing a report on our website, communication with stakeholders, and does it stimulate ownership? Uh, from the definition of quality culture, uh, we can see that active engagement and reflection stimulate improvement. So to achieve improvement and enhancement, we can separate between informing and telling stakeholders on one side and engaging and involving them on the other. So we might need all these uh, aspects, but reflect on when and how we use these. So that was a bit about the why questions. So we will now look at what and how and present two examples from Nuket and our work. The first example is from an evaluation of teacher education. So in Norway, we do institutional accreditation and most institutions have the right to establish their own programs. But the way we supervise these programs is through evaluation. They can be thematically or discipline oriented as this one. Uh, so we evaluate uh, five-year integrated master programs at university level. Uh, I will focus on how we designed this evaluation uh, when we chose the themes, the questions to address and the process and how we work to create trust, ownership and knowledge and how we first mapped and analyzed our key stakeholders and then interacted with them in a variety of ways. Um, there are two other stages as well, so the data collection and analysis and report of findings, but I will not talk so much about this. So why did we focus on the stakeholder involvement and map mapping of those? Uh, we wanted it to be a formative evaluation to create trust, legitimacy, building relationship, but it was also important for NUCA to gain knowledge, to recruit the right international and national experts and create ownership um, at program level and institutional level and to design a process that felt relevant and useful for the institutions and the program. So as I said, we started with the stakeholder analysis and drew up a plan on how to engage the different stakeholders 
from information and communication uh, of some and to engage and really involve others. Uh, and some of them uh, we met with. So we had 21 meetings, for instance, with key stakeholders involving actors from the ministry, universities, U Norway, university staff, students, student unions, employers, different unions, school leaders and school owners who are employers, alumni and researchers as well, to mention a few. Uh, we also set up a reference group with the institutions um, mostly senior managers and program leaders, as well as students and some teacher unions. Uh, and we engaged, for instance, students in particular by hosting a seminar. Uh, we planned a seminar with student leaders and the student unions, which was set up for and by the students to stimulate enhancement and to inform the students about this evaluation. And for the broader audience, we did a more formal consultation. Uh, we have also uh, involved others uh, in different ways. But as uh, was mentioned previously, all these feedbacks were made public on our website. And we also think that was important uh, to just mention a bit of involvement also in from the data collection. Um, we designed surveys and that is also a way of communicating uh, around quality. So we developed three special surveys for these evaluations. Um, some surveys to school leaders and teachers, but also on students who dropped out of the teacher education programs, um, as well as normal students. We do uh, normal surveys. We do more ordinary to students and to teachers. Uh, so we analyze and synthesize on these findings, both statistically and thematically, and all this data is provided back to the institutions. And in addition to forming part of the evaluation data, we also discuss this with the uh, institutions, for instance, on seminars. And we also use media, blogs, and other <laughs> ways of communicating, uh, but also to disseminate the findings and partial results. So another example of what and how is the sharing of experiences with and among peers. And firstly, I would say that our periodic reviews of the institution's quality work is organized in projects of four to six institutions. And this allows them to keep in touch during the review and our surveys indicate they do this. And we also do follow up seminars two years after the audits where the same institutions meet again and making them share peer experiences with each other and with us also outside a review is extremely valuable. Secondly, we arrange seminars and workshops for the institutions. And in these, we invite the institutions themselves to take the floor in addition to us from NOKUT. And thirdly, we could mention that we have a podcast disseminating good teaching practices to teaching staff all over Norway. And the guests in the podcast are teaching staff from the institutions. We also publish reports, blogs and newsletters in order to reach out. We have portals making different kinds of data accessible. And we have thematic analysis on our website. So returning to our original question, we now hope that we have given you some insight into the how, uh, the uh, who, what, why, and how of NUKUT's communication with stakeholders. However, in this last uh, slide, we want to tie them all together, as you can see with the arrows. We believe that communicating with and involving stakeholders has some complexity to it. And we believe that who you involve affects how you do it, that the reasons behind the why affects what you choose to do, and so on and so on. And so these are all interrelated, and the questions should therefore be addressed simultaneously. Taking into consideration the definition addressing stakeholders' responsibility and interest in success, we believe in a broad approach to the communication with stakeholders using a variety of involvement strategies for a variety of different stakeholders. And with this broad approach, we make use of our different qualities as an agency, hoping that we are making enough space for both quality assurance and quality enhancement 
at the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to you both for your input. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm particularly pleased that you've highlighted this, this difference between communication and engagement and involvement, these, these different um, sort of uh, stages or approaches um, to, to involving stakeholders. I think that's really important that, that we bear that in mind. And also these different tools that you use. I'm interested, I was interested to see um, uh, some of the range of different approaches um, that you use on very much on a communication level in terms of um, blogs and, and, and podcasts and, and newsletters. And I wanted to ask you um, about something which uh, it didn't actually come up in your presentation, but I saw it in the study. So I, I don't know if you're able to, to say a word or two about it, which is the, um, uh, the plain language initiative, which I understand that, that Nokut has. Um, may, maybe you can just mention that briefly. Uh, I could start. Uh, yes, the, unfortunately, there wasn't room for uh, including all aspects uh, in this short presentation. But uh, yes, uh, that is uh, an initiative for uh, actually reaching, reaching out for not only civil society, but perhaps that is one of the reasons we do it, because the institutions that undergo go reviews, they would, they would always be interested in what's in the report and they will perhaps understand uh, quality assurance language or quality enhancement language. Uh, but we see that um, working with the plain language uh, initiative, we, we, we reach out uh, broader. And um, an example of that is that the National Students' Union in Norway, we have one National student Union, um, they actually contacted us a couple of years ago when we started our third cycle and said, now we've read all the reports from the pilot and we're interested in discussing um, uh, the reviews and interested in assessing the way forward for quality assurance in Norway. So that means must mean that plain language reaches out. And we also, of course, feel that um, trying to write in plain, plain language yourself um, makes uh, the, the, the reports, our reports, much more clearer. Would you add something, Helen? Um, no, I think that's good. I think plain language is a way of reaching out to different stakeholders and a, a diversity of stakeholders, not mainly the academic world or quality stuff <laughs> talking yeah. their tribe language. So I think it's a beneficial for yeah a huge variety of stakeholders and including more. So. Indeed, I think this is a this is a really point an uh, important point and something that we can all bear in mind. All also at at Enco, we we're very familiar with talking very much in our closed circle of of, um, of quality assurance professionals, and we um, you know perhaps even more so at the European level, we have a certain set of, of jargon and, and acronyms, and and it can be um, uh, difficult sometimes to remember to step out of that. Um, so thank you for that. There is a question um, from the audience about um, asking panelists. And, and participants to reflect on the actual impact of the involvement of stakeholders and are they really achieving the um, the objectives um, that um, that they're seeking um, through the stakeholder involvement I'm going to keep that for the end but I wanted to bring it up so that you can all start to to reflect on it uh, a little bit um, before the discussion at the end uh, so at this point I'd like to um, invite um, Baduhi from Armenia um, to give her presentation over to you Thank you, Anna. Greetings, uh, everyone from Armenia. Um, I am Vartuhi. Uh, I am uh, from Armenian Quality Assurance Agency. Uh, I'm the head of the Institutional and Program Accreditation Division at ANQUA. And today I will speak about uh, student engagement um, activities in uh, quality uh, assurance. And I will talk about uh, our experience in this. Um, shortly about our agency, we have been uh, we have been established in 2008 by the Armenian government, and we are an independent ag agency with uh, 20 staff members, but a lot of stakeholders you see in the uh, in the photo. And um, our uh, agency fosters the assurance of tertiary education quality standards, and we have um, uh, we have our approach. This is enhancement led approach in the uh, quality assurance. 
And our values are public trust. Uh, we promote also e uh, innovation in the uh, education. Um, uh, we promote uh, equity, accountability, and a very important uh, value is collaboration between our stakeholders. And we do our uh, work based on these values. Um, next, I would like to talk about um, uh, student engagement in AMPAS activities. Uh, usually, we have uh, mandatory, uh, mandatory engagement uh, at the policy level. Uh, we have, uh, it's mandatory that in our uh, AMPAS Board of Trustees, there is a student member. And this uh, student member should be trained, uh, should uh, also be as um, uh, participate uh, also in the accreditation processes uh, before uh, becoming a student member member in the Board of Trustees. We have also uh, a student, a PhD student member in the Accreditation com Committee uh, of ANQUA, and also this student should be also trained. Uh, there is one other requirement uh, that in the external review processes, uh, one student member should be, uh, should be in the panel, in the expert panel, when doing the accreditation processes, and the student is uh, paid and is the full member of the accreditation um, uh, of the expert panel. Next, uh, we also uh, have a requirement for the universities. We require that in the self-evaluation uh, report, when writing the self-evaluation report, they also engage uh, students. So this, uh, these are uh, how we promote student engagement in our different activities. Now I would talk about uh, our student voice project um, and um, we uh, established uh, this student voice project in Anhua uh, in 2011 with a group of uh, sociologist uh, students. Uh, and we, um, uh, during that time, uh, when the student voice project was created, uh, th there was an aim to create internal teams at the universities for collecting data on the quality of education. However, after some years, they conducted some uh, research and they, uh, and they uh, for example, have some teams who were collecting data and they published their reports. But after some years, we understood that the motivation is not high uh, based on these uh, activities and we changed the paradigm. We changed the paradigm for the student voice project and we, uh, we understood that um, uh, the student should be engaged in the internal quality assurance activities, not only collecting data about quality of education, but also uh, to be fully engaged to participate in the uh, self-evaluation report in the surveys, conduct surveys, and also uh, to be motivated being a, a part of um, uh, internal quality assurance. So we changed the paradigm and now the students um uh, we, we focused our train uh, we focused the activities of the student voice project to build a network of students who will be uh, engaged in uh, engaged in the internal quality assurance activities uh, so um, now I would like to talk about the uniqueness of the uh, today's students engagement framework. Uh, we, uh, the uh, uniqueness of the uh, student engagement framework of uh, ANQUA is um, that we create inter-university students network. What does it mean? We, uh, we uh, have the students from different disciplines. They have the opportunity to meet with ANQUA leadership and ANQUA staff and uh, coordinators during the trainings and uh, as influencers to talk, uh, as quality assurance influencers to talk with ANQUA leadership to manage, uh, to understand uh, the issues. They also have the opportunity to uh, talk to each other because uh, the students get together from different disciplines, from different experience, different backgrounds, and they are motivated to talk also to each other uh, and also with experienced experts and uh, quality assurance representatives uh, and uh, management from uh, different higher education institutions. The uh, students have also uh, opportunity to uh, uh, participate in the research uh, activities and thematic analysis uh, of ANQUA. When we, uh, for example, have uh, some issues to be uh, to research, we also include students uh, students in this uh, work. Next uniqueness of uh, this uh, engagement uh, framework is the real work environment. The students have uh, a place, a special place in Anqua uh, and uh, they uh, at Anqua premises and also 
uh, they uh, work in the real environment. We, uh, they, uh, they review the self-evaluation reports from different higher education institutions. They participate in the role plays uh, with uh, different expert training uh, sessions and also they participate in the accreditation processes as ob observers before becoming uh, expert uh, student experts. This is, this is the uniqueness of the uh, engagement. And the next one, uh, next uh, slide also uh, is about uh, uh, the trainings, how we do the trainings for the students. Uh, currently, we have two stages, uh, uh, two main stages of students. We train the students for the external quality assurance, and also uh, we have a spe special session for uh, internal quality assurance. For the external quality assurance, the students, uh, for, for the stage one, the we, we um, present the students, the, their role and responsibilities in the external quality assurance, processes then after for, uh, after uh, this uh, this uh, second uh, stage is uh, they are conducting case study as i said before they are uh, reviewing the real self -evalu self evaluation report uh, the, the expert report and the follow up of the, uh, the tertiary level institutions they prepare uh, they are conducting desk review prepare uh, prepare uh, questions and also they are doing focus group meetings between of each other they they, uh, for example, one group becomes the university uh, university representative, one group uh, uh, experts, and they ask questions to each other. This is the role play. And after that, uh, also they present the results. They write a report and present the results to UNCLA staff, and we discuss them how they uh, how what, what kind of questions they, they have, so they have the opportunity to meet with the coordinators and experts. Um, uh, teachers experts and academic experts and talk, uh, talk also with, uh, to them. Uh, next, uh, next stage uh, is uh, involvement of students in the accreditation processes as assistant to coordinators. Uh, for example, uh, and we call this learning by doing. Before engagement of the uh, expert panels, they also uh, are involved uh, as a coordinator, assistant to coordinators, and uh, they help and see the process. And then after that, they can be engaged uh, as uh, student experts. Uh, next one. Uh, next one is, as I mentioned, uh, we also have um, the second part of the trainings are um, about uh, uh, students' engagement in the internal quality assurance, and we have three stages of here. Uh, firstly, we uh, present the students uh, they, about their role, uh, about their role of internal quality when they are engaging in the internal quality assurance processes. The second stage, um, uh, we uh, present the students how they should be engaged in the self-evaluation process at the universities, what kind of questions they can raise. And, uh, and the next one, we have, uh, we have visits to the tertiary education institution and they can meet with the IQA units to ask questions, to see how they work and also to be engaged more in these processes. Uh, this is the second part, and also uh, we have um, uh, identified some uh, important things that Student Voice Project in Ankwa is conducting. Uh, firstly, I would like to mention that we uh, there there was a one challenge for us that we uh, recently we have seen that not all the disciplines we covered. So uh, this is one uh, challenge, and this is one aim that we should cover all the disciplines. Uh, for example, recently we see that not many students uh, we have trained uh, in the medical uh, in the medical part, in the medical uh, discipline, and we organized uh, uh, merely for uh, medical students trainings. For example, in 2019, we organized only for the medical students, uh, trainings for the medical students. Then uh, also uh, there is one experience we had. We had uh, one of the universities asked us to train students uh, of their university governing board members and uh, we conduct these trainings and uh, after that we conducted a survey to understand how was uh, the effectiveness of our trainings and we see that the motivation and engagement of the university governing board members 
uh, member students increased and they started to be more involved in the quality assurance activities, conducting surveys, focus groups among students in the universities. So this was uh, also effective, uh, one effective experience of one club. Uh, then uh, uh, the next um, uh, discipline that Ankwa Student Voice Project promotes, this is regular annually meeting with education man management academic program students. Uh, why we emphasize this? Because uh, in our agency, these uh, academic program students are uh, potential employees because we uh, engage them as employees from the education management and these students have the opportunity to conduct master thesis and also research in our agency because we have data uh, regarding education, uh, education quality and uh, when we have for example some needs we uh, ask these uh, students and they conduct research and they uh, also uh, do their master's thesis based on a real wor uh, work environment. Uh, next one, I would like to also mention that uh, this was also a challenge uh, a few years ago that uh, regional students did not participate in the, uh, these trainings and uh, before pandemic, uh, we also conducted online trainings for the regional students. Uh, via Skype, we, use, uh, we used Skype and we did some uh, regional uh, students uh, trainings for, the, uh, for some regions. Uh, then next one, uh, the, uh, also important, important to mention that annually we have uh, annually we have uh, student uh, student conferences, uh, and uh, during these conferences, the students summarize the results of their research, and also they hear some success stories because we have many many success stories that uh, the students who trained in Ankwa became uh, became, for example, workers at the quality insurance units in the universities. Also, uh, they. Uh, had some uh, also they were engaged in the European Student Union activities they uh, were chosen as uh, students to participate in the reviews in the uh, European Student uh, uh, Union's uh, activities and uh, they hear during these conferences success stories uh, engaged in different conversations communications and exchange experience so this is uh, this is the main uh, also uh, things and also I would like to mention that we uh, continued the trainings and discussions during COVID-19 situation via Zoom and um, uh, actually the students um, also had the opportunity to be a part of uh, activities in Ankwa. They participating in the online trainings for experts in the discussions uh, and uh, in the monitoring activities uh, and monitoring visits, online visits that Ankwa conducted during this time, this uh, pandemic time. And uh, we didn't stop the activities, we continued. And also the uh, the students, uh, there was uh, there, uh, there was a need to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of the online learning. And now the students conduct the research. They already uh, have done some uh, focus group with different student, uh, student members. And they, uh, after one month, they will present the results uh, of uh, this research uh, regarding the online education during this pandemic time. One minute, please. And and uh, and also um, the, the, uh, the focus of the next years, what we would like to do is uh, training of the PhD students. Uh, also, this is one of the challenges I would like to mention that we would uh, also conduct trainings for the PhD uh, during this uh, year. Uh, we would do announcement for the PhD students because we see that uh, their involvement is also very important in the IQA processes. Here you see some photos and the general uh, description, the general um, framework description. And um, so thank you very much. Uh, and if you have questions, I would like, uh, I would be happy to answer. I'm sorry if I exceeded the time. No worries, that was very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, a, a very comprehensive approach to um, to training the students. And I have um, in the chat uh, uh, perhaps a slightly provocative question from, from my colleague uh, uh, Maria in the ENCRA Secretariat, um, asking that considering students are, are not students forever or at least not often, not usually in, enrolled at the university for more than uh, a few years. Um, is all this investment in, in, in the training programs worth it? 
for bearing in mind the limited period in which they will will participate in in the QA processes. Sorry, um, Anna, I didn't get the question. The, um, the 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 training that you give to students is very substantial and presumably also um, requires a lot of resources, both both human resources and and financial resources. Yeah. Is it worth it, given the relatively short period of time in which most students are are involved in in higher education or, or are involved in um, QA processes? Yes, <laughs> it's, a little provocative, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think yes, because during this time, we when we work with students, um, we see uh, the their uh, issues. We uh, we discuss the issues with them, and we understand, and we use this in the accreditation processes. Uh, so yes, this is um, we have uh, in the uh, in Ampa we have several uh, persons conducting the trainings. This is also time. Uh, um, uh, time and resources, but uh, usually uh, in the accreditation processes, we see that it's worth uh, doing these uh, this kind of trainings for the students. Um, and um, uh, also after after uh, the trainings, after the trainings, we uh, also see that their career path. I also mentioned that the students after graduation, they are going to uh, work at the IQA uh, IQA units, and this is very important that uh, when they go to IQA uh, units, we see that uh, our people uh, are there and they understand uh, what are the issues and they. Uh, this becomes uh, more effective, their self-evaluation and our work is uh, connected with their work. So um, uh, these students are not, um, yes, I understand that many students will graduate and go to different disciplines, but we uh, have uh, already, uh, I have the numbers, 45 uh, students uh, are engaged in different universities in the uh, quality assurance units and these people are very very important for our agency because we work in close cooperation with them so this is um, this is another part that's very interesting actually then that in in a sense you're you're not just training your students for their current engagement in in quality assurance but you're actually training the the next generation of of quality assurance professionals um very briefly i have one more question um from the audience um which touches actually on the involvement of of students in internal quality assurance and what do you see um as being the main motivation for students to to participate um, we have seen that uh, we have seen the main motivation when students are demanding of their quality of education. They, uh, when they are engaged in the internal quality assurance activities, they, they understand the issues and also they are they are becoming more demanding. Uh, and uh, this is one of the motivation, and um, I, I think this is this is uh, good because when uh, if I uh, when I was a student when I was a student uh, uh, this opportunity if there is uh, such kind of opportunity for me uh, that uh, I can understand the main issues of my education I will also talk with uh, with the university high management and the quality of education will. Be, uh, will be improved. So this is one of the motivation that we encourage students to be a part of internal quality insurance, to understand the issues uh, of uh, their education and to raise uh, and to raise also their voice. Uh, this is uh, I, I forgot also to mention that during the conferences we invite the Ministry of Education and Science uh, and also the students have the opportunity to raise their voice. Uh, during these conferences uh, to the minister minister and different uh, policy level people and also uh, we uh, when we uh, before pandemic uh, we did this kind of uh, annual conferences in different universities each year we choose one university and do the conference uh, for that uh, in that university so as also the high level management also see these bright students and also see their issues this is one motivation, and I would say that in Armenia, I don't know in other countries, in Armenia, they are getting motivated when they see that their uh, voice is raised and they uh, see the impact of their voice in the uh, improvement of the quality assurance activities. 
Thank you very much. Um, I've seen in the chat there's quite a lot of general questions being being posted, not just to the panelists, but also, also to other participants about how they engage uh, students. So I, I do encourage you to to share your own uh, examples there. Um, clearly, we could do a whole webinar just on on student engagement, um, but um, we we do have one more presentation to fit in today. So um, without further ado, I hand the microphone over to Alistair. Thank you, Anna, and uh, hello, everybody. It is a pleasure to meet you all um, in one way or another, and I hope to see you all at other events in the future. Um, hopefully that is okay. What I was asked to do um, is to talk a bit about how we support stakeholders to be involved in the organisation, QAA, uh, and also uh, review work. Uh, my name is Alastair Delaney, as you can see, and I'm the Director for Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland in QAA, and I'm based in Scotland, which is extremely sunny today. Now, that is very unusual, so I'm in a very good mood. To start us off, some facts um, that might, be, might help you to understand um, what I'm saying. Um, QEA is a not-for-profit charitable company, so it is not part of a ministry or part of a government. So we have a board of directors um, to run the organisation. And most importantly, we operate across different jurisdictions. Um, you can see in lovely blue there is, is Scotland, where I'm from. Uh, green is England. Um, yellow is... or yucky yellow as well is Wales and the grey is Northern Ireland and I have to apologise extremely much to Karina for the fact that the rest of Ireland which should be attached to that grey part is missing from this map <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm very sorry Karina I don't know why we do that but uh, yes the, where Karina comes from is uh, to the south of, of the grey part of that map but Northern Ireland is still within the UK at the moment. Um, what that means is we have very different policy environments. Um, an example of that would be that to attend university in Scotland, it is free. Um, students don't have to pay tuition fees, whereas in England, they pay over £9,000 to, uh, to participate in, in higher education. So higher education is a devolved matter to the different nations. That also means that we have different funding models, um, both in terms of funding for the universities, but also in terms of uh, us as an agency. And so we have to be responsive to different needs and demands. But one thing that QAA can do is to bring the UK higher education stakeholders together. Um, and that's very important uh, for us. So, if you look at stakeholders in, in governance, there's probably nothing very exciting here that, that doesn't happen anywhere else. But we do have the board that I mentioned, which has a wide range of, of interests within higher education, as well as other areas. So they are not just people who are currently employed or have been employed in higher education. We also have two student members um, who are on the board. One is from the National Union of Students and one is an independently elected student member. To support them, we have things like what everyone will have, an induction pack and induction sessions with the chair and the senior leadership team. Um, quite important in this case to try to understand what is a complex situation with the different countries and the different approaches that QAA must take. But probably most interesting, we have what's called a consultative board. Our external stakeholders used to be able to attend the board as observers at their meetings. Um, but that was changed um, and we created a consultative board instead, which meets in advance of our normal board meeting. Um, now, by consultative board, I mean people like funders, governments, the, again, the National Union of Students, people who are external stakeholders we work with, but we are not on the board. And so we highlight to them the big items for discussion at the upcoming board meeting and get their views, which is fed in to the discussions at the board, but they no longer are able to attend the board meeting itself. Again, interestingly, we have a student strategic advisory committee, um, and that is 13 students from across uh, the UK. And the purpose of that is to ensure that the student voice is fed in to the QAA board. We believe strongly that having one person on a board doesn't represent the student voice. You need other mechanisms to ensure that you're getting a broader view from students as far as possible. 
Um, to support uh, our student advisory committee, we have half days inductions um, and we have individual meetings with people like myself to explain the situation. And a summary of their key discussion points from each meeting goes to the QA board as well as representatives from this board. So the two student members that I mentioned earlier um, would take the issues that are of concern to our board. Moving on to training for reviewers or experts, um, ESCOV was, was the report was very complimentary of the work that we do in terms of training um, our reviewers. Um, we have uh, multiple review methods, and so I think it was it was by essential or by you know, we we had to do this um, rather than it being just something that's, that we are really really good at, because we have multiple review methods to cope with the different countries, and they can be quite different in their nature. So that meant that we had to have generic training, and then we also had to have method specific training. So a core, if you like, for all reviewers, and method specific training depending on which review method you were being uh, deployed to. Um, it, reviewers must have completed the training to be used um, and to help support this work we have a reviewer management group across QAA this tends to be the operational leads for review methods and they would look at everything to do with how we engage with reviewers from their recruitment through their deployment training supports right through to when they off board if you like when they leave us we also have an assessment and reviews group, which I chair across the organization, which is more strategic and is looking at things like approving new methodologies um, for review and also, for example, how we responded to COVID. It approved our approach to how we responded to COVID. And of course, there was COVID and no doubt questions will arise in the discussion uh, panel part uh, about how any of this was changed um, as, as a result of the COVID lockdown. I just wanted to give you two examples of things that we do to make it real, to try to help it uh, help you understand what we do. So the first one is our establishment reviews in Scotland called ALEAR. Um, we have generic training for all reviewers who are deployed to ALEAR. Um, that would include things like health and safety and data protection. Um, these are available online. You can take part in them when you wish, um, but it is a, a, a proper uh, commercial product which records for us who has done the training and who hasn't, and you have to complete a, a small test at the end. We have a resource base of training and advice for reviewers available on our reviewer extranet. So again, reviewers can visit that and take part in other training and other videos or, um, or other content, which would help them understand the reviewer role. We have a student reviewer briefing. So in addition to what I'll cover in a second, we bring our student reviewers together to give them additional support to understand their role in relation to uh, reviews. And then we have reviewer training, which is usually over two days to support everyone. That would include um, everyone. All of our reviews have uh, student reviewers as part of that. Um, we also hold a preparation event for institutions undergoing review to help them understand what it is that uh, the review process looks like. That would involve um, students and senior staff in the institution. And uh, we have an expectation that students are involved in the self-evaluation process in, in Scotland. And for example, in Wales, students can actually create their own self-evaluation report to us for a review, as well as and alongside the institution's self-evaluation report. We have CPD events for experienced reviewers and experienced reviewers also mentor our new reviewers um, so that they can give them support. The second example would be our international quality review, which has different uh, demands, which is why I've used it. So IQR, those teams include international reviewers from around the world, student reviewers and UK based reviewers. Um, again, everyone who wants to be involved in one of our um, IQRs has to successfully complete the training programme. But this time the training is all online, but it is synchronous. Um, so that has to be delivered at specific times, which creates a few challenges when you're trying to bring everyone together around the world um, at the same time. But that's the way that we've decided to deliver it. Um, there's a variety of ways that we do the training event, clean presentations, interactive teamwork, case studies and simulated review activity. But there's also some work that people have to complete offline. So roughly each training package is spread over four weeks with a commitment of two and a half hours per session, which if you add it all up, ends up with training of about 15 and a half hours in total to be part of um, that process. 
so these are just two examples of what, what we do. Um, and I, I'll be very happy to take any questions on that, um, but also to pick up in the general discussion anything uh, more broadly. Thank you very much, Alistair. Um, there's there's a lot of chat um, going on um, about um, student engagement, and and thank you for everybody that, that's contributing to that. Um, I, perhaps I wanted to just put put one question to you, Alistair, about the students that you engage in your various quality assurance activities, both as panel members, but also perhaps, for example, on the student strategic advisory committee. Is how do you in um, how do you ensure a, 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 a sort of a, a diversity of students are represented here? Um, um, you know, we talk a lot about um, the need for, for diversity and inclusion, but sometimes it's a, a certain type of student that, that wants to be involved in these kind of things. So how do you ensure that a, a diverse voice is heard? Yes, and the, for example, in the Student Strategic Advisory Committee, we don't take students from just one source, if you like, so not just the representative bodies um, you know, in universities, although they could be relatively diverse, but to try to ensure diversity, we go to other groupings of, of students, so more specialist groupings, for example, to ask for representation to make up the 13. And that way, the, the committee itself has a really good balance of different ethnic backgrounds, different, you know, um, you know, geographic backgrounds, any other um, criteria. Um, it's always a challenge though. Um, I think as we talk about um, engagement of students in, for example, self-evaluation in a university and equally in a national body, certain students are just not as motivated as others to take part in that kind of activity. They are harder to reach. And I think we all struggle to try to make sure that we are actually getting out beyond those who are the next budding politicians or who really enjoy uh, representing others. Thank you, Alistair. Right, I would, um, if I can just ask you to stop sharing your screen and then we can have all the all the speakers um, in view. And I will now um, try and pick up on, on some of the questions and, and comments that have come up um, uh, throughout your presentations. Perhaps to start very concretely, um, there's a couple of questions related to um, involvement of um, labor market representatives and representatives from, from the private sector. And I think we've seen already um, Melia mentioned in the, um, and it's in the study that, that this is a group that um, that can be quite difficult to engage with. So I wonder if, if any of you have um, some um, concrete examples of, of how you select um, or how you find um, representatives from the labour market to engage with and, and particularly in relation to the private sector. A difficult question. Go ahead, yeah. Karina. Yes. No, please. I suppose again, um, having a close collaboration with with your your the other bodies and agencies and organisations working in the same operating environment really helps to um, garner kind of proposals. You know, for particularly for labour market representatives. So, for example, some of the funding bodies that work quite closely with with groups of uh, labour labour market representatives, the institutions themselves actually are quite connected to to labour market, and we can also actually tap into that. Particularly the likes of institutional technologies with regional uh, remits to engage with industry and employers, and the even the department uh, that that we engage with, we have found that um, uh, I suppose asking particular questions for certain reviews and visits and analysis and evaluations there's always labour market representatives and of course uh, we have the other agencies that we engage with um, you know in the, in the general jurisdictions such as Alistair mentioned there uh, so there's always there's always a good source um, and there's always numerous sources. Notwithstanding that, it's always difficult and the time management piece for them is essential, I think. Any other one else want to comment on that? I think I would just add, we, we have regular relationships with the regulatory bodies. So, for example, if you want to be a doctor or a dentist or a whatever, then obviously um, there are regulatory bodies over and above the, the degree um, that someone might be taking part in. Um, but I would agree with Karina, the difficulty is um, their interests are, 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 are quite focused, they are very busy, uh, and so it can be very difficult to, to engage them, them fully. We have, say, quarterly meetings, I think it is, with our, what we call PSRBs, it's our um, 
the regulatory bodies that, that I mentioned. Um, we're also, for example, doing a degree apprenticeship review currently uh, in Wales, where we're going out to employers of different types and natures to try to get a feel for how the apprenticeship program is working. But they are very busy people. And during this period as well, at the moment, in terms of COVID, they have very little time to, to give to an external engagement. Thank you. Can I add also, mm -hmm. yes, uh, in, in our case, um, in our board of trustees, we have the, uh, in Armenia, there is an employer's union, and uh, in our uh, board of trustees, we have the head of this uh, union, and we collaborate also uh, with the employers in that union. Also, during the accreditation processes and the site visits, we have uh, meetings with employers, and uh, these uh, employers, also, also, we collect data about these employers and also they become uh, a part of our um, engagement and we when we for example uh, develop or review anything in the policy level we collaborate with them um, and uh, this is this is the approach of uh, our agency thank you okay i'd like to then come back to a question that i put to you earlier so you've had advanced warning on this um which was um coming from one of our, our audience members about um to what is has been the impact of the stakeholder involvement in in your quality assurance processes and and do you find that you are achieving the 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 objectives that you you set out at, at the start um Melia mentioned um in her presentation at the start some of the the various goals um uh, objectives objectives of, of stakeholder engagement and regardless of which one is most important for your agency um, are, are you are you achieving that is it is it working okay sorry for jumping in again but um, I would say that we are absolutely achieving that um, as I said earlier engagement with stakeholders dynamic engagement really allows you to understand the perspectives that they're coming from, the constraints they're operating within, everything right down to the timeline burden. Uh, we have found it so successful that we've established a stakeholder engagement division across the organization. And um, I suppose some of the, the, the last slides that I presented there are really reaping the benefits of that. So focused, strategic and structured um, collaboration with your priority stakeholders and also other stakeholders that really impact on your work that really contribute to your work so I don't think the organization uh, would have established um, a strategy around this if, if it wasn't uh, of benefit but I, I can't I don't have enough time to go into the benefit but certainly understanding each other is a huge part of that I think uh, because we're all working together and that's that's quite essential and it doesn't underpin undermine um, our independence as an organization because our stakeholders need that independence they need an objective evaluation at the end of the day as well this look from Nokis I think you wanted to comment as well uh, yes I was thinking about saying that there are um, sometimes there is the goal of of the stakeholder themselves uh, feeling that there is impact and sometimes there is the need for us as an agency to feel that so of course when we do seminars and workshop which is um, uh, quite many uh, persons from the higher education institutions especially uh, who are attending uh, we of course do surveys and we get feedback that we look at and we evaluate and uh, we are very glad to see that uh, they they um, they find it meaningful and they find it especially meaningful that the, there is a combination of us talking uh, their peers talking listening to each other uh, sharing experiences I think that's one of, of the success success criteria uh, for us so um, uh, on the other hand, when the, the goal is sort of that we uh, would like some to see our, some impact, uh, uh, we haven't uh, mentioned yet uh, that, of course, when we do methodological development uh, with our quality assurance framework, we, of course, include stakeholders in that. And then I feel that it's, it's us, you know, <laughs> wanting to feel that impact. And, uh, and we, really, we really feel it because, as Karina said, that dialogue is really meaningful. And that means that also our methodologies are more fit for or as fit for purpose as possible then and um yeah so i think we we feel it in various activities as well as our breakfast seminars and of course we would have quit doing our breakfast seminars if no one came but there seems to be 
that's also a sort of knowing there is some impact that pe people keep coming back also during COVID. So yeah, that's some perspectives from Nukut. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously very difficult to measure effect. Um, and we do surveys, as Asla mentioned, and we try to also follow up with different kinds of evaluations looking at effects. So at least we can see how the institutions, for instance, say that they want to change their practice and how they have actually changed their practice. But was it due to NUKUT intervening with seminars or whatnot? <laughs> Might be other waves in the society as well. So effect is very difficult to measure, but I think we got some indications that most of these are working and to our benefit as well. So. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a, a little bit of time left. Before I get to the obvious topic of, of COVID, I just want to pick up on one more very concrete question from the chat, um, which is um, about experience of student participation in evaluation of transnational education, considering that in, in some other regions of the world, the emphasis on the student voice, especially in, in panels and governance structures, um, is a bit less familiar. Um, Alistair, I know QQA do a, um, QAA do a lot of um, uh, work transnationally. Um, do you? How do you involve your students in that? Yes, um, in the models that we have in the different nations, then if a university was operating in another country, then we would always um, try to set up uh, meetings and focus groups during that review with students in the foreign country. And so we would want to understand from their perspective, what was it like to, to, to be part of that university's provision in whatever country it was. Um, that that can be difficult um, and, and it's not always um, you know, as, as, uh, as easy to get together groups of staff and students in, in other countries for that. And it's not um, the main focus of those uh, reviews in country. However, we've just published our handbook for TNE and e um, review that's just been agreed across the UK. Um, and that will mean that we're moving to doing um, in-country reviews. So we're actually going to the country to look at all the provision in, in that area. And so that will mean that we will be able to obviously get a far better um, understanding of what the provision is like in that, in that country. Um, and able to look at and give feedback to the individual institutions who are operating in, in that country. So we're due to start that in the autumn, but the handbook has just been published on our website. Uh, any other of the speakers wish to comment on this question? No, okay, then I will move to the elephant in the room to round off, which is um, obviously the, the current COVID uh, situation. Um, uh, an open question, I think. Um, how has, has the current circumstances changed the way that you engage with your students, uh, sorry, with your stakeholders? And have you perhaps um, learned lessons, had experiences that you, you would want to take um, forward um, when things, uh, I hesitate now to say return to normality, but um, but uh, when when we resemble a little bit more um, what we're used to. Who wants to go first? It's a big question. <laughs> Alistair, you have your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think it's different for different stakeholders. Um, I think that some things have actually got a lot better. Um, in a country like Wales, which is actually not that large, but it's actually difficult to get from the north of Wales to the south of Wales. It takes far longer than you would expect. Um, and I'm sure people who are listening to this will have similar circumstances. Um, they have loved the fact that all of our engagements have been online because it's more democratic. Everyone is on a screen together. It doesn't matter where you are. Um, you haven't had to travel three hours to get there and three, no, you've got three hours to get home. So I think that things like that have, have helped us. And I think we've learned a lot about how we will change the way that we establish, for example, committees or networks or groups or um, you know, consultations in the future. I think in terms of reviews, it's been interesting as well. Um, I think we underestimated the requirement of review or review teams and review panels, experts, um, we ended up having to quickly provide training on how to use Microsoft Teams or Zoom <laughs> um, and use all the features of that. Um, and we were learning ourselves because we hadn't used it that extensively to begin with. But it was clear that 
um, we had quite a bit of work to do for teams to be comfortable so that the panels could focus on what they were there to do and not worry about the technology. So, for example, in some of our um, uh, reviews, but most of the ones that I'm responsible for, we had an administrator set up the meetings, we'd arrive for the first five minutes of every um, online review meeting, make sure everything was okay, and then they would go away again. And that meant that the review panel felt comfortable and was able to, to do their job. So I think there's a lot of learning, and maybe we're not at the end yet, we're still dealing with a crisis, but we're starting to think to what will this look like in the autumn? And I think it will look different from the way that we operated before. Thank you. Um, who would like to go next? Please just jump in. I can say something from Nukut. Uh, we have some of the same experiences as Alistair uh, said. We have moved pretty quickly into this uh, digital new life and uh, learned new programs. And who, if somebody had told me we were going to do institutional reviews by Zoom uh, two years ago, I, I wouldn't have believed them. Um, but what we experience overall is that it's an increased flexibility. So actually for our expert panels, we feel that there have been there has been more meetings because you can just meet online. And so that has actually been a benefit for um, the discussions in the expert panels, uh, not needing to travel. But uh, I think we have two uh, issues that uh, at least I'm a bit worried about uh, if this situation is going to be um, long lasting, even more long lasting, or we never get back to sort of physical uh, arrangements again. And that is the networking, because we know in our service that people uh, appreciate networking, uh, meeting new people uh, that they can contact later. Uh, fewer people contact each other after a webinar, I think. Um, and as regards the institutions, we, we know that physical in, um, institutional reviews builds this common trust that we have you know been building up for uh, many years so what happens with that if we only meet online so there are some some aspects there Uh, Vaiduhi, you, you mentioned already in your presentation um, a little bit about uh, about how you've adapted your your um, engagement with the students um, in the past year. Have, are there things that, that you will take forward, um, lessons learned from that? Um, yes, uh, it was um, working with, um, I agree with the colleagues that it gave flexibility and we also um, stopped our accreditation processes, but recently, uh, a few months ago, we started uh, because we piloted monitoring visits. By monitoring visits, uh, we piloted how this will work when we do real accreditation processes. We started with the monitoring visits online and it, uh, it was really uh, effective, but I agree with uh, Aslan that um, uh, the communication and with interaction between experts, this is a challenge and we also worry about this. Uh, but um, uh, what we were uh, well, we have done um, uh, usually uh, during the year we have uh, meetings with internal quality assurance units uh, from different higher education institutions and we uh, continued during pandemic but we uh, started to uh, meet with discipline by discipline. For example, we meet uh, people from art uh, universities, uh, quality assurance uh, units, and we uh, collected data how they manage for example, uh, online learning in these, for example, medical institutions, art institutions to understand they, their issues. This is one lessons, lesson learned that was effective, and uh, but the challenge still remains that communication and interaction between people remains one of the challenges. Thank you. And uh, Karina, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, completely agree with everything that everyone has said so far. I think we're all thrilled that we have been able to pivot to the online uh, evaluations and engagements. We've also been able to convince the stakeholders and providers in particular to take all of that up. But um, 
I suppose one of the, the real benefits for us was in our strategic approach to that structured engagement with our stakeholders. So for example, about 18 months ago, similar to Alistair's uh, reference earlier, we did set up a professional body hub where we had all the other national professional bodies, regulators, standard setters coming together and uh, with a view to trying to engage with providers more closely. And we found that we had fantastic access to them and their feedback during COVID. We also um, discovered that uh, there's far more accessibility online to people who are otherwise perhaps inaccessible. So last year, um, just to get an initial feedback on the uh, alternative arrangements that were put in place for COVID across the system that's further uh, and higher education and training providers, we did a, a very unusual evaluation, which was not on our corporate plan. Um, it was it was in no way, um, you know, there was very little advance warning for it, but we did uh, an evaluation of all of those modified arrangements across the system with over 56 contributors to that particular piece of work. I think we had uh, just short of 100 engagements online with providers and with their stakeholders. We had every service provider nationally contributing to this particular piece of work. We had all the social partners, we had the funding bodies, we had pretty much everybody contributing to understanding how the national standards um, were faring out in the context of the COVID provision, which was that that very, very quick pivot to online for providers. And, and the big learning for us really was that when we actually did that um, independent evaluation, we could see that taking a slice out of the system like that, we could actually see the internal quality system was working, the external quality system was working, the governance features that are put in place by a quality system and are quite central to it, they were all working very efficiently. In fact, they couldn't have managed without them. Um, and also, um, I suppose it was just another form of evidence provided that the national quality, internal and external quality infrastructure is really essential. Um, so it was just a nice opportunity, I think, first of all, to call on our stakeholders, having built relationships up over, over the last couple of years, quite closely structured relationships uh, and MOUs and things like that. But it was also really good to be able to demonstrate, particularly to the accountability agenda, that when you slice into the quality system, it's actually alive and kicking, active, dynamic and really supportive in a crisis. So that was very important for us. And, you know, we're looking to see what we can do next um, to keep that picture alive, because as we all know, as agencies, it is so difficult to describe what is quality, what is quality assurance, what are the benefits? Well, well, that was exactly what we saw. And we were able to demonstrate that very, very well. That's great. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting, comprehensive answers from everybody. And I think, um, you know, we have the same questions here at ENCA. We've been doing more, more webinars in order to to reach out to to our own stakeholders. And, um, we, you know, one of the advantages of that is perhaps that we we are in, able to engage with some agency staff that, that we might not normally see at our, our physical events um, because there's not so much resource for, for so many people to come. Um, I, we've got uh, just two minutes left. I've got one final question question very concretely um, from the audience about how to take into account um, teachers unions uh, in your stakeholder engagement because the teachers working conditions are considered to be a very uh, important um, condition um, uh, when we talk about the quality of education. So do we have any um, a, a concrete example of, of how you engage with, with teachers unions? Karina, you're nodding, please go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, we do. Again, this is a priority stakeholder for us, uh, again, working across the system with teaching and learning staff and uh, further and higher. So we certainly make it our business to have structured regular engagements with the teacher unions. I suppose the main thing there is that they understand what's coming down the line with regard to policies, procedures, changes, uh, new ways of, of working that might impact on their own members, which is very important to them. So uh, very well planned in advance structured engagements and updates on the qualifications as well as the quality assurance and also the 
potential impact to them. Uh, that's that's actually worked quite well for us because understanding what's actually coming out and what the intention and objective is behind an initiative or a policy, or a process actually is really, um, is it kind of kills any of the kind of, I suppose, misconceptions or poor perceptions of, of what is really behind a particular agenda. So that's worked really well. Any other contribution on this topic? Very, very quickly. We, we, we would engage like Karina regularly to understand the challenges that the teacher unions would be raising with us um, about the situation inside universities. Just to add one, one little thing, I think COVID um, created situations, certainly in, in the countries I operate in, where there were big groups set up to look at what was the quality of the provision during, during COVID, sometimes minister-led, um, and that would involve all the stakeholders. Um, so, for example, in Scotland, it was led by the Minister for Higher Education. It involved everything everyone from the teacher unions to ourselves to providers um, and I think that helped everybody actually it was an interesting um, outcome of COVID because I'm not sure all that group would have been in the same room before um, but they certainly were in the same room now. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we are out of time. We're promised to finish um, at, at quarter two and, and we have reached that time. We have packed an awful lot in um, to this webinar. Um, it's, it's such a huge topic and, and I'm sure many of the themes that we've touched on, we could have dedicated uh, standalone webinars to them. So I think plenty to explore in the future. Um, do take a look at the, um, uh, the, the event page on our website. Uh, the resources mentioned are, uh, and the presentations are all there and the recording will be there shortly. Um, so I think it just leaves me to say um, thank you very much, um, firstly to all of our, our speakers for, um, for contributing to today's discussion, um, to, to Milia and the other project partners um, of the ESCA project for, for having um, put this topic on the, on the table and given us some great resources to draw from, uh, to my ENCA colleagues that have been helping to run uh, the webinar and of course to all the audience, the participants um, for your great questions and for sharing your own um, your own examples and experiences. I hope you have an uh, enjoyable rest of the day and uh, and indeed weekend and I hope we see you um, at another anchor webinar again soon. Goodbye. <laughs>